My observations on human existence have led me to the following conclusion about August Strindberg. He was born, and then he died. Somewhere in the middle, there is, or rather was, a life that involved three wives, 60 plays, some of which are considered classics, and a mustache and brow that would not be equaled until Marlon Brando was born some 70 years later. It's the touching story about that little boy from Stockholm that no one liked, who eventually rose up to become the craziest master playwright since Eugene O'Neill. Our tale begins with Carl Oscar Strindberg, a dashing, penniless young aristocrat coming across the busty carry-on housemaid Ulrich and Norling, and deciding that it was the right time to get married and have nine loud children, the third of which is our mustachioed protagonist. After the novelty of creating their own private child factory wore off, Carl Oscar and Ulrika realized that they didn't much care for each other and began quarreling. Fortunately for Carl Oscar, though, Ulrika ran down the curtain and joined the choir invisible, leaving Carl free to marry younger, less clammy women. This depressed the young August Strindberg, who became the 19th century equivalent of a MySpace emo kid. In 1867, young August grew tired of his humble beginnings and ventured forth to fulfill his dreams of becoming a famous chemist. Having failed all his university exams, though, and depressed at the knowledge that he'll never get to play with Bunsen burners again, the young Strindberg took an opium pill expecting to end his life, only to awake three hours later feeling oddly rested. Strindberg abandoned his dream of anthropologic fame and fortune in favor of a career in journalism and the library arts. It was around this time that Strindberg met the bosomy Baroness Suri von Essen, wife of the delightfully stereotypical Baron Karl Gustav Rengel. Strindberg was never one to let an overweight baron get in the way of his good time, and seduced the lovely lady using his zany-haired charms. Seven months later, their passion resulted in a few figure-ruining consequences, and the two got married. Under her influence, Strindberg managed to get a few writing gigs. He wrote a well-received novel, The Red Room. His play, Master Olaf, was staged with some success, and he even wrote a critical look at Oscarian Sweden and got accused of anti-Semitism. In an attempt to escape controversy and avoid getting the Mel Gibson treatment, our beloved Strindberg moved hearth and home to France, the capital of culture and pretension at the time. During these years, he began a correspondence with Friedrich Nietzsche, probably resulting in the most pessimistic discourse in the history of human conversation. Feelings of prosecution and an increasingly turbulent marriage with the Baroness led Strindberg to a flirtation with the sweet lady crazy. He began to gain an unhealthy fondness for the green fairy herself, Absinthe. Strangely enough, though, hallucinogenic liquids didn't help his mental well-being one bit. He became increasingly paranoid that his wife was plotting to send him to the crazy house, which would have been totally justified of the lovely Baroness because her husband was totally and completely bonkers. Strindberg took to his desk, writing a series of works about what a bummer it is to be married. At some point in this period, Strindberg saw a production of Ibsen's A Doll's House and formed the rather interesting opinion that it was the controlling husband who was the real hero of the play. Strindberg was not about to let this stand and wrote his own considerably more sexist interpretation. You see, Strindberg was very much of the opinion that being married was the worst thing since being crippled, but a life without sex could directly cause you to become crippled. Just what's a bloke to do? A short story he wrote, titled Reward of Virtue, which controversially poked fun at the concept of Holy Communion, made him the Marilyn Manson of his day, delighting the young and enraging the crotchety and old. He was brought up on blasphemy charges by the Church of the Insecure, but was acquitted. Over the next few years, our dear August wrote two of his most well-known plays, The Father and Miss Julie, a play dealing with one of Strindberg's favorite themes, a Darwinian battle of the sexes. Strindberg staged a series of one-act plays, mostly dealing with Darwinian battles of the sexes. Having gained theatrical success writing about how much marriage sucks, in 1889, Strindberg decided to end his own. Marriage, that is, and moved to Berlin, the capital of strict German efficiency and Lederhosen at the time. Whilst there, he met a foxy femme fatale, a bosomy Austrian journalist named Frieda Uhl. Overwhelmed by her personality, the smitten Strindberg absentmindedly forgot that he's made a career off bashing marriage and decided that it was time to get hitched again. They honeymooned in London, but instantly started arguing, causing our hero to retreat to the island of Rugen. His recently failed marriage gave him just the energy he needed to complete an entire anthology about how much marriage is a harsh mistress. Feeling a tad guilty about abandoning his screeching children, and feeling picked on by the larger boys from the critic circles, Strindberg entered what could accurately be referred to as his crazy period. That summer, crazy had a name, and his name was Swedish and spelled kinda funny. 
feeling that Strindberg had too much crazy for any one man, the world committed him to a hospital in France. Strindberg decided to record his mad ramblings in the surreal novel The Inferno. Turning his back on the writing talent that had been so good to him, Strindberg took up painting, finding a particular fondness for portraying the sea as seen from the inside of a cave. Our hero ultimately recovered from his crisis when he came to the conclusion that perhaps some people were just made to suffer, and perhaps he was just one of them. This understandably cheered him up enormously. Returning to the theatre, Strindberg created a dream play, an unconventional Freud-inspired theatre piece using the surreal logic of a dream. The play tells the story of Agnes, a young goddess who comes down to Earth to better understand the pain of humanity. The actress playing the young goddess gave Strindberg some pain of humanity in his pants. And figuring he probably couldn't do any better than a goddess, the smitten Strindberg took a page from the Henry VIII Book of Matrimony and made her wife number three. After getting most of the crazy out of his system, our mustachioed hero took to the political scene and wrote a number of historical plays. Plays like Queen Christina, the story of a daft political leader who must constantly be stopped from showing her ignorance by the people around her. And Charles XII, the story of a positively stupid but inexplainably popular conservative heir to a political dynasty who gets his country involved in two useless and expensive wars, ultimately bankrupting his country and becoming an unloved shadow of what he once was. Thank God that will never happen again. Now, with 70 plays and novels under his belt, Strindberg retired to the house he badassedly christened the Blue Tower. Finally, stomach cancer did what a lifetime of self-destruction could not, and killed August Strindberg on May 14th, 1912.